May the 4th, may the 4th be with you. And always, we are not in a galaxy far, far away, but we are focusing on Star Wars and what one can learn from that galaxy created by George Lucas about four decades ago. Joining us now is a man who's written a book about it. He's Stephen Kent. The book is How the Force Can Fix the World. Thanks for joining us, Stephen. Hey, Larry. Thank you. So first of all, when George Lucas wrote these movies, did he he just wanted to sell tickets, right? I mean, he didn't really think that he was creating decades worth of lore and, well, religion, did he or did he? He did. I just finished George Lucas's biography by Brian J. Jones. It's a, it's a wonderful read. And he represents to me a filmmaker who knew exactly what he was doing from the very earliest moments. Yes, Star Wars became a surprise hit that the studios never expected. Yes, it blew up to a level that George couldn't have personally expected either. Uh, but once you get past Empire Strikes Back, George is building uh, a franchising empire along with a sort of universalist religion uh, that can actually guide its fans and uh, interest people in any any part of the world. It was all part of the plan. Until Disney ruined it, but we won't go down that road today. Uh, you. <laughs> you write in your book and in a lot of your uh, posts at uh, your Substack, This Is The Way, um, you mm -hmm. write about the fact that really the through line of all of these movies and all these stories is the ongoing fight for liberty, for freedom against those who would steal our freedom. That that really is what it's all about, ultimately. It is. Uh, every Star Wars trilogy is really about its titular character facing their fears, their uncertainties, their paranoias in some way. And Yoda tells us this in episode one, that fear leads to anger, leads to hate, leads to suffering. I think this is actually a really constructive way to think about politics and the different sorts of cycles that we go through in our own country. I'm personally like a child of the, the war on terror, terror era, uh, and I've seen this country just in my lifetime drift from 9-11, uh, fear, paranoia, giving the government all the authority it needs to keep us safe, you know, quote unquote safe, uh, to eventually the enemies becoming domestic and hate groups rising on the far left and in the far right as well. Um, in this climate of fear and everyone fighting for control of the federal government. Um, I think that George has been explicit in this when he wrote the prequels as well. And it's relevant to us still today. But there is a religious aspect to this, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, the force is an invisible, mystical thing that uh, gives power to those who use it either for good or for evil. Is there a morality to it, though? I mean, I, I'm, I'm a person of faith mm -hmm. and I do believe that there is a different, there is good and evil. And if we are able to harness our faith in that way, I want the good guys to win, but there's got to be a morality associated with the fight. Yeah. So I've, I've tried to draw a distinction here between Star Wars offering morality versus it offering virtues. Uh, I don't believe that Star Wars is capable of offering morality, but in my book, How the Force Can Fix the World, I do offer what its seven core virtues are, that of courage, uh, empathy, hope, choice, aka free will, uh, and humility, among some others. Um, these are actually stories throughout Star Wars, you know, seeing beyond people's masks that they wear to the human being inside, uh, accepting that you might not have the answers to everything and being willing to seek out new information, believing that you always have a choice, that you can always turn back from a dark path that you've been on. These are virtue-based stories of Star Wars, similar to the kind that you might read in, in Greco-Roman myth. Uh, and these are valuable, especially to kids who are looking for, you know, storybook type guidelines for how they might live their life. But they should be getting their morality, uh, to be clear, from their parents and from church. <laughs> yeah. How does um how does Jar Jar Binks fit into all this? Because that guy, he's just got to go, right? Can we just like like ignore him or just like drown? Hey, you can't drown him. He's freeze underwater. Jar Jar Binks is the worst. Uh, he is certainly not popular, and uh, it was it was really interesting to see in The Mandalorian, uh, Ahmed Best, the actor who portrayed Jar Jar Binks, get to make sort of a comeback of sorts in The Mandalorian as a Jedi master, uh, fending off uh, clone troopers during Order 66, the purge of the Jedi. Um, I mean, gosh, that guy went through really like hell and back uh, for playing that character. It's really interesting also reading the story about Jar Jar Binks' actor 
uh, his suicide attempt that he eventually made because he was being hated on so much was being driven by hatred he was getting from left-leaning fans accusing him of racism and cultural appropriation uh, yeah. and him as a as a you know person from like the Haitian islands black guy he took it really really hard um, and sort of we've retconned the history on the bullying of Jar Jar Binks to being like right wing, you know, trolls online. But he was getting it from the far left and uh, nearly destroyed his life. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's it's amazing, actually, the backstory of all of those movies and all of those actors. We're out of time. But, uh, sir, may the fourth be with you, as they say. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back tomorrow. Same time, same place. In the meantime, I'll see you on the radio. 